I were to ask you to picture a racist in your, in your mind, what would come to your, in, in, into your imagination? Most people would actually picture probably a member of the KKK dressed in their white hooded full regalia. Some others might even picture Nazi Germany, or more specifically, Adolf Hitler. But how many of you would picture what is supposed to be the representation of an objective legal system in this country, Lady Justice? We all like the idea of justice being blind, having a system that doesn't pay favor to others because of their identity, because of their wealth, their power, their prestige. But what happens when you find out that we actually li live in a system that sometimes upholds inherently racist ideologies? Sometimes in order to move forward, we need to actually take a step back. We need to reframe the conversation and, and really think about what we're talking about here. I talk to a lot of people about racism, and a lot of times they assume they know what I'm talking about. But in reality, we're not talking about the same thing. A search on Google doesn't quite help. Google essentially defines it as a belief, and that's what we're usually taught in school, that it's a belief, a belief that one race is superior to other races, or maybe some are inferior to others. But as a person of color, that's not my day-to-day -day experience. My greatest struggles for inequality don't come from fighting an ideology. They come from fighting system. <clears throat> in addition to being a belief, racism is a social structure in which some people have benefits, some people are treated be better than others, some people have opportunities that others don't have simply because of their race. So that makes fighting it a lot more difficult because not only are we just struggling to get exposure on the injustices of the system, but now we're navigating through an inherently broken system. To give you an example about this is a story about what I've been fighting against. In 2009, my band's attorney recommended that we file an application for a trademark for our name. It's actually something that's quite common for bands to do. Uh, trademarks ensure that other people don't use the name, which as you might imagine would cause a lot of confusion in the marketplace. It's something that is actually quite simple, but I never would have imagined it would be something that would consume the last several years of my life. I started an Asian dance rock band called The Slants. It was a creative outlet for some artistic expression while celebrating our cultural pride. The name comes from our perspective, or our slant on life, if you will, as people of color. However, the trademark office rejected the application of our name, saying it was a racial slur to people of Asian descent. You see, there's a law out there that says that the trademark office can't register names that they deem to be disparaging. It actually doesn't happen all that often, but when it does, they say that a substantial composite of the reference community has to take serious issue with it. So I started wondering, you know, what kind of evidence did they bring to the table in order to demonstrate the collective outrage of Asians across this country? Well, first, they quoted UrbanDictionary.com. <laughs> you know, reliable source, right? Then they found an anonymous quote on a message board. Not somebody who said they were offended by our name, but somebody who said they simply didn't like the name. And third, they send in this photograph of Miley Cyrus pulling her eyes back in a slant eye gesture. And I just remember hanging my head, talking to my attorney about this and thinking, they simply don't, they simply don't get it. After all, everybody in my band is of Asian American descent. We play at many of the world's largest Asian cultural festivals. In fact, we actually travel around the country doing workshops on racism, diversity, and Asian American culture, sometimes even on behalf of the US government. So they simply just don't understand what's going on here. You know, we, f we decided to fight back. We thought maybe they don't understand this entire process, and they certainly don't understand this entire concept that we call reappropriation reclaiming this, uh, the word slant. You know, for us, the name was also a nod to Asian American activists who have pioneered the use of this term in a positive manner. So when we fought back, we actually decided rather than submitting it as an electronic copy, my attorney said, let's go ahead and send them a box of stuff so they have to physically scan every single one of these pages. We sent them 2,000 pages of letters from activists, from advocacy organizations. I got uh, one of the editors at the Oxford American Dictionary. We got two independent surveys, and on and on and on, thousands and thousands of pages. 
And this is what they said, that your effort was laudable, but not influential. Again, they simply just didn't get it. And this is the thing about it, is that they don't appreciate the idea of reappropriation. You know, we decided that rather than continue fighting this on their terms, rather than continuing to dump in evidence since they told me it wasn't influential, we said, let's step back and let's reframe this conversation. After all, the word slant can mean many different things. So why did they apply a racial slur to my application, but not to the hundreds of other people who have submitted applications for this term? You know, the, the term slant means so many different things. And what's interesting is that the racial connotations of the term are so obscure that every major dictionary publisher has actually removed it from its list of possible definitions, including the printed version of Urban Dictionary. Again, that's a testament to the power of reappropriation and what it can do. See, the, the idea of reappropriation actually isn't new. I mean, the whole process of taking negative ideas, symbols, words, and putting them into positive parts of your own identity, that's been around long before hipsters thought that being ironic is cool. But whether it's the repurposing of a racial epithet or taking on a stereotype for social political empowerment, it's an important process that continues to change society today. And reappropriation is especially important when it comes to things like race, gender, sexuality, religion, or other massive parts of our identity of who we are. And I thought, you know, the role of the government, why, why are they legislating this to even begin with? <clears throat> we, so we asked them, and they answered of why they decided to apply this racial slur to us. They said that the applicant is a founding member of a band composed of members of Asian descent, and thus the association. In other words, their reasoning had nothing to do with whether or not our name was offensive, whether or not Asians cared about our name or not. Their reasoning on why they applied a racial slur to my application was because of my race. And this is the very definition of racism. A federal court document publicly available showing that the reason why they rejected this trademark case is right here because of that. Not only did they say that, well, you're of Asian descent, they actually said you're too Asian if you could believe that. Um, not only did they mention my Chinese and Taiwanese heritage, but they were also really eager to point things out like, oh, you guys have a dragon on your album cover. You have the audacity to put photos of Asians on your website. And sometimes we use artwork that is indicative of our cultural heritage. In other words, they thought the more Asian we became about being Asian, the more uh, racist we were towards Asians. And I thought, well, this is a TED talk. You like charts, right? So if you were to actually chart out their logic, it would look something like this. <laughs> the x-axis, of course, represents the amount of Asian stuff. And as we get more Asian over here, we become more increasingly racist towards ourself. That huge spike there is actually when we added a new member to our band, exponentially increasing the rate of racism. <laughs> That's the logic that they use to justify their actions. And of course, it is completely ridiculous. It's just silly, like that anyone would think that this is happening. But it's been happening for about five years now, and we're actually continuing to fight this at a, at a federal district court. You know, when we look at this, I, I started looking at other trademarks that use the term slant. And I found out that, yeah, there has been a couple hundred. In fact, there's been 800 of them, 800 trademarks for the term slant, only one in all of history, US history was ever denied for being racist towards Asians. And that's me, an Asian American. In fact, the trademark office never even considered slant to be a racial slur until an Asian applied. That's the logic that we're dealing with and that's what we're having to deal with. And obviously, I believe that reappropriation is a powerful tool for social change because sometimes things like satire and humor and irony can cut at difficult truths that sometimes people are reluctant to approach. But for me, it was all about empowerment. It was all about creating social change and creating an identity that others couldn't touch. We, as a band, wanted to share our perspective on life as Asian American artists. The government decided that they didn't want that to happen. You know, the role of government shouldn't be legislating. It shouldn't be deciding what a community can or can't define itself as. 
You can look at case after case, and example after example, that when it's left to the dominant group to decide identity, not only are they completely inconsistent, they're completely off base when it comes to measuring the sentiment of people who've been marginalized for decades or sometimes centuries. It wasn't that long ago that the Nazis actually took that same role and decided to legislate identity. Symbols like the Star of David and the inverted pink triangle were used to quickly identify people in concentration camps. Yet within years of the end of the Nazis regime, those same icons became symbols for liberty, pride, and said, transforming the social consciousness of the people around them. Social theorists say that our identity can be influenced by, but can also influence the people around us. And every single study ever conducted on reappropriation confirms this. They show that when people be, begin to reclaim identities and terms, it, there's actually a shift in power, that there's a change in group status, and there's actually re less power that oppressors have over the oppressed. That's the wonderful and powerful thing about reappropriation. Terms like gay, queer, guido, Christian, even otaku are all phrases that were birthed in pejorative use, but they were steadily moved into one of ownership by large portions of those respective communities, changing them into words of power instead. The law that the trademark office is referencing and that is relying to, uh, on to, in order to make decisions about our case was written in 1942, decades before the Civil Rights Act was even passed. It's actually been unfairly targeting minorities for about 70 years now. And it's crazy to think this, but almost a century of oppression in this area is now riding on the case of a single Asian dance rock band. And that's us in, in Philadelphia. <clears throat> it's undeniable that a, the quality of a person's life, their opportunities, their benefits, and how they're treated can all rely on their identity. People should have that right to choose their own identities. They should have that ability to reclaim stereotypes or negative things or insults and turning them into bits of armor to protect themselves, to, to mobilize communities to create actual social change. You know, the reason why a lot of people ask me, why, don't, why didn't you just give up? Why didn't you just stop fighting for this trademark? I mean, it's, it's only a trademark. After all, you can still use the band name even if you have the trademark registration. But to me, that's like saying, you could still ride on the bus. You just got to sit in the back. You can still have this. You just don't get the same rights as everybody else. You know, that's like trying, when people try and convince me that, oh, your sister can't get married, but she can still live with her partner. I mean, that's absolutely absurd that we as a people have to live a subservient life just simply because of our identity. I like to say this, that the role of, of identity, it's so important in our lives because it's, it's much like what Martin Luther King Jr. said, that an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And to me, this is a, definitely an injustice. This is indicative of what I talked about earlier, that racism is a system, and it's definitely one that we need to fight. You know, you have a right to choose your own identity. That is absolutely your right. But the protection of that identity is the responsibility that belongs to all of us. But then again, my view happens to be a little slanted. Thank you.